There are a couple of very interesting legal issues here. One is standing. Um, why, why is that issue? Let's start with that. What's the issue around standing? Because it's not, it doesn't speak to anything underlying about Miffy Pristone or abortion necessarily. It's about whether this case is valid. Yeah, it's good to see you, Ali. And before answering that, I just want to disclose that I am unabashedly against this lawsuit. And indeed, my law partner, Jess Ellsworth, argued the case brilliantly today. And indeed, one great thing about the oral argument today is all the advocates were women, all three of them, uh, Solicitor General Elizabeth Perlager, as well as Aaron Hawley, arguing for the religious doctors. Now, there are two issues in the case. One is this doctrine of standing that you're asking about, and that essentially asks who can come into federal court and file a federal lawsuit challenging something. And the second is the merits. Did the FDA ignore science and safety when it expanded access to mifepristone in the last few years? Much of the argument today, as you highlighted, was about standing. And basically, Aaron Hawley said, there are these seven doctors who have conscientious objections, and it might be the case that at some point, uh, one of the doctor's patients will take mifepristone, and it might be that that might cause a side effect, like a headache, and that might cause that person to go to the emergency room. And if that person goes to the emergency room, it might be that that person will be need to be treated. And if that treatment is necessary, it might be that one of these seven doctors is the person treating it. That's a ridiculous chain of causation. It doesn't work in any other aspect of the law, and I don't think it worked in the Supreme Court today. Um, justices on both the left and right wings of the court just expressed massive skepticism about this. Um, and so I, I think that's where the case will be decided. To the second part, the issue of judges and science. There was an exchange between uh, Jess Elworth, whom you uh, mentioned, and uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson on this, and it's relevant. So I just want to play for our viewers uh, this this uh, this exchange, which begins because we don't have video of its audio, begins with uh, Justice Jackson. Do you have concerns about judges parsing medical and scientific studies? Yes, Your Honor. I think we have significant concerns about that. You have a district court that, among other things, relied on one study that was an analysis of anonymous blog posts. You have a, another set of studies that he relied on that were not in the administrative record and would never be because they post-date the FDA decisions here. They have since been retracted for lack of scientific rigor and for misleading presentations of data. Those sorts of errors can infect judicial analyses precisely because judges are not, uh, they are not experts in statistics, they are not experts in, in the methodology used for scientific studies, for clinical trials. Neil, this is not just relevant and, and hugely relevant to this particular case. It's relevant to a lot of cases that are making it to the Supreme Court these days. The idea that agencies of specialists headed by people who are approved by the United States Senate are not to be trusted with the things that fall into their expertise, but that that should be adjudicated either in the courts or determined by Congress that in itself could lead to a major mess in the way government runs. It would be unprecedented uh, in, the, in the modern developed world. It, but there are a lot of people who think that should be the case, that there shouldn't be agencies and there shouldn't be experts and courts and Congress should make these decisions on scientific and technical matters. That's almost all exactly right, Ali. You know, it's the cannot be the case that you can just, as an individual doctor, afraid that one of your patients is going to have a side effect, go and challenge the thing and then go to a judge and say, you know, stop it, this from being sold nationwide or prescribed nationwide. Uh, this case didn't belong in the United States Supreme Court. It was a dead loser every day of every week. It was just because of some rather extreme rulings by uh, some judges that forced this case to go up to the Supreme Court. And as Ms. Ellsworth said, you know, relying on anonymous stuff, blog posts, retracted studies. I mean, this was 
not the way federal judges, uh, you know, ordinarily behave. And so it was dismaying. And I think the most important worry about a case like this is that if it did go forward, then it's not if it's mifepristone today, it could be, you know, who knows what drug tomorrow. Um, you know, that is not the way to run a government. It's not a way to run a society. Now, we didn't cherry pick those quotes that we, we, we showed you at the beginning of this segment. There did seem to be broad skepticism across the political uh, spectrum from, from a number of the justices about both the merits of the case and the, and the process by which it was brought to the Supreme Court and the standing. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I've seen more than 500 cases there at the court. And, in, in, you know, norm, normally it's difficult to tell what the justices are going to do. Sometimes it's pretty easy. Today felt like one of those pretty easy ones. Obviously, anything can happen. But I did feel like today there was a wide consensus on both sides of the court, as well as the middle of the court, that this challenge had to fail, that it just didn't have merit, and that the pers people trying to raise it just didn't have a claim to walk into federal court in the first place. So I expect a rather swift decision uh, that may be 8-1 or 9-0, uh, wow. against these challengers to the mifepristone drug. Uh, and, you know, I think that the good upshot is that mifepristone will be safe and available to be used by women the way the FDA has prescribed it uh, to be used. Uh, and this challenge is going nowhere. I saw you sent a note out the other day to everybody trying to explain the valuation of this Trump company. So put that aside for one second, because that's interesting uh, in and of itself. Trump's got more money out of this thing than logically it would be worth. But there's something else to it. And we were talking about this Pennsylvania billionaire, Jeff Yass, who is also a very big shareholder, shareholder in ByteDance, which is the parent company of TikTok, which Donald Trump for a hot second was against and wanted to ban. And then Jeff Yass made his way to Mar-a-Lago, yep. saw Donald Trump, and voila! All Donald, sudden, Trump Donald Trump said, Trump's, you know what? I like TikTok. I think I like TikTok. Yes. I think I, so, so, so Jeff Yass backing this is, 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 it's not complicated, right? Here is a mega millionaire, right? One of the richest right. guys in the country, the richest man in Pennsylvania. Now, the biggest backer of the shell company that's merged with Donald Trump's company. So right there, boom, one could say he's trying to curry a favor. But Jeff Yass is not a traditional investor, right? The hedge fund that he's co-founded, Susquehanna, is what's known as an options trading firm, right? It's a derivatives house. So when lots of us look at this company and the fundamentals and say, this that's makes no sense, sense right. right? This is why you didn't see traditional lenders, traditional insurance companies say, yeah, we're going to lend Donald Trump money against the stock because when you look at the company, all it does is lose money. It has a tiny amount of, of, of advertising revenue, right? It has absolutely no features, right? Any social media company that has gone public has some sort of innovation. This company does not. Right. But the way Yass invests, yes, he's investing. He, he, he's going to back this company, which is going to certainly help Donald Trump, hoping that Donald Trump will win. But even if he doesn't, I am sure this guy has this position hedged in six different ways that it's not nearly as big of a loss as one would think. Right. So what do you call it? It's it's I mean, the, if you're Donald Trump, the SEC is looking at everything you do. So it's likely not illegal at this point. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Yass is just the, the CEO of a company that's an investor in a shell firm that merged with this. It does feel like influence peddling. Absolutely. And one could say that buying up shares of this stock is basically like unregulated ways to be a huge donor to Donald Trump. But guess what? You might not like it. It might feel yucky. It might feel like a grift. But at the end of the day, he may be the luckiest guy threading this needle and it might work out for him. Now, Donald Trump can't sell his shares in this company right now, you know, at one point today, they were worth six billion dollars on paper. At the end of the day, they were worth four and a half billion, still huge numbers. He's not in a position to sell yet. He has right. a six month lockup unless he gets a waiver, which he might. But remember, when he goes to sell, this stock might tank. Right. He's the biggest shareholder. And so, so all of a sudden, when you try and unload that many shares, it suppresses the market. But lots of people who are buying up the shares are also Donald Trump super fans. Right. And 
We've got the meme stock traders again. Remember, since 2019, you had all these day traders in the market saying, right. we're going to run a stock up. We're going to take it to the moon. So you've got those elements all coming together. And now Donald Trump, like peak 2024, has become a meme stock. Are you I mean, you talk to people all the time about this. Is anybody are any sort of sensible, fundamental investors like our viewers should be the people who say, hey, a stock's should be worth about this. Are there any of these kind of parties involved in the stock? Not really, but you definitely have options traders who are saying, I'm going to bet on the fact that Trump it, might win. Gonna I'm going to yep. see where things are going to be six months from, excuse me, six weeks from now. Um, no, but you do have a, a group of those feverish day traders that, you know, right, we're living in a time when IPOs are hot again. Bitcoin is doing well again. And since 2019, basically, when commissions to trade stocks went to almost zero with the Robinhood yep. app and others, right? When the barrier of entry lowered so much, yep. so lots of everyday people could get involved and trade the markets, lots of those people are now investing in this. Is it going to work out for them? Unclear, but we say this every day, like, you know, buyer beware. Market Just like Trump present. Bibles, right? We could right. laugh about it and say, this is a grift, this is absurd, this is hypocritical. But guess what? These are free I'm markets. Buying. If people want to buy the Trump Bible, have at Steaks it. Steaks or vodka or whatever the case is. I'm not sure about sending a urine sample to the Trump group to get checked. But, That's your you know, own whatever. personal. That's my yeah. own personal stuff. Some people might like to send that to him for their own reasons. You and I talked uh, the day after you made an impassioned speech to the state uh, in front of a group of supporters, but really uh, intended for Republicans in, in your state legislatures to say, don't do this. Don't do this. You're, you are going to do real harm. And the fact is, the populace, the, the population of North Carolina is on your side as it relates to abortion rights. But the Republicans did it anyway. Yeah, this is not who we are as North Carolinians. And the thing about it is that every single Republican voted to override my veto. Every single Democrat voted to sustain it. Even Republicans who had promised that they wouldn't do it. That shows you that we just cannot believe them. Many Republicans are so extreme, they're now trying to moderate a little bit during the campaign, but we cannot believe them because every single one of them voted that way. Look, this is happening all across the country. Women's reproductive freedom is under attack. We saw it in the Supreme Court today. I mean, clearly they're just going after women's reproductive freedom in every way that they can possibly think of. That's why it's so important for us to defeat candidates like Mark Robinson here in North Carolina with a great Democratic nominee, who's our current general, Attorney General, Josh Stein. And that is why we have to elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. You know, they will put Roe v. Wade into federal law if we can get a Congress that uh, would send them a bill. They were here today. There's no better place than North Carolina for them to come today than to, to celebrate health care. I mean, we already have a, a million people on the Affordable Care Act. We've just expanded Medicaid in a bipartisan way. And now we're signing up about a thousand people a day. And these are our child care workers. Mm -hmm. These are people who look after our seniors. And Donald Trump and his the people like him want to take it away. Candidates like him want to take the health care card right out of the hands of people who have just gotten it here in North Carolina. We have to stop them. Which I like, it's hard to understand. I mean, I lost count of the number of times Republicans tried to what, what would reveal and replace uh, uh, Obamacare over the years. In the end, they're still running on that. No one in all those efforts, dozens of efforts, came up with something better, came up with an alternative. I, I think we can all acknowledge everything can be done better, but that's not what Republicans were trying to do. This is kind of like the southern border issue. This is kind of like reproductive rights or IVF in, in Alabama. It's not clear what the goal is other than to be disruptive. Well, they talk about repeal and replace, but there's no replace. There's no replace, yeah. Uh, every, every single time they talk about getting rid of health care for people. And, and just, just like you say, the southern border, here we had legislation that was the strongest border protection uh, ever. And Republicans, because it didn't fit their political narrative and because Trump told them that he wanted to keep this issue alive for the campaign, they pulled out of this agreement. 
And, and that is the way they operate. They're going for power and they're not paying attention to the real issues that are facing the people of North Carolina and the people across this country. So we're gonna work very hard. I think the road to the presidency runs through North Carolina. And when you look at our statewide candidates, they've nominated people like Mark Robinson, uh, like Dan Bishop for attorney general, who's in Congress now and part of the Bobert Gates Marjorie Taylor Greene cabal. They've nominated uh, uh, someone for superintendent of public schools in North Carolina who believes that teachers ought to have guns in the classroom, who homeschools all of her children and took them to January 6th at the Capitol. I mean, that is the kind of extreme Republican lineup that's in North Carolina and why we believe that we can get a massive turnout in North Carolina for President Biden, for our slate of Democratic candidates, and turn North Carolina blue uh, in 2024. We're working very hard, and we were glad to see the president and vice president today. They've been here quite a bit. We are a targeted state, and we're going to continue to work hard to make sure that this election preserves our democracy, preserves women's reproductive freedom, preserves the opportunity for people to get health care, because I think that's what everyday Americans care about right now. We have a piece of news in here. Uh, Marilyn Lands has just uh, won the House district seat uh, in Alabama uh, on, on a platform, and she's a Democrat, on a platform of uh, uh, appealing, uh, repealing Alabama's no exception abortion ban, fully restoring access to IVF and protecting the rights to contraception. So this is the things of what you speak. For those of us who uh, don't understand how North Carolina works, why is it that statewide a guy like you got more votes than Donald Donald Trump did um, in in 2020, but at the same time you've got uh, veto-proof majorities in in the, your, your state houses. What's what's the what's the thing we have to understand that puts Mark Robinson in play? Given that he his the things he stands for stand in stark contrast to what North Carolinians say they want, particularly as it relates to things like abortion rights. Well, the first thing is technologically diabolical partisan gerrymandering. That's how they control a supermajority in the legislature. For four years, we had broken that supermajority, and every single one of my vetoes held. I think when you have a lower-profile race like lieutenant governor, uh, he won in a crowded Republican primary with 30-some percent of the vote, and it was in a presidential year, a, a lieutenant governor's race can, can not get very much attention. People are finding out who Mark Robinson is now. And I believe that North Carolinians do not want to go back to the days of the culture war. Remember, I got elected at a time when we were still walking through the rubble of the bathroom bill yep. battlefield in North Carolina that was wrong uh, in and of itself, but also hurt our state economically. We were able to get that repealed. Now you have someone like Mark Robinson who wants to go back to the culture war. Donald Trump plays into that narrative as well. I think people are tired of it. I think particularly now with this assault on women's reproductive freedom, when you add that to the anti-LGBTQ, when you add that to the jerking away health care from people and then the positives that, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have done for this country, connecting people to high-speed Internet, lowering the cost of drugs and, and, and insulin, yeah. making uh, one of the best investments in infrastructure we have seen in, in a generation. All of that is positive. We're going to be talking about that, but we're going to be taking it to the Republicans as well. I just want to bring you back to that comment you just made about the, the bathroom bill. Um, there, there's a letter that from the Connecticut Democrats who uh, wrote, written to officials at the Connecticut Department of Ed, uh, Economic and Community Development to explore opportunities to attract businesses from North Carolina in the event that Mark Robinson is elected uh, uh, you know, the nomination of Mark Robinson as a candidate for governor of North Carolina. We're in a time unemployment is low. Wages are going up. Um, GDP is strong. It's not the most even economy in the world, but it's going in the right direction. It's a bad time for a state, particularly North Carolina, but any state to come up with things that are going to cause businesses who need to keep their employees happy because it's hard to get employees these days. It, it's a it's a bad time to be making those kinds of decisions about about abortion and about gay rights and, and things like that. Yeah, why would we make those decisions that would turn people away? I love my buddies in Connecticut, but we are not going to elect Mark Robinson so they can stay away.
Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.